The main purpose of yoga on a global level is to recognize that our individual consciousness is one with the universal consciousness. This is a lofty goal for anyone. So on a practical level, the main purpose of yoga is to enhance the flow of energy and consciousness within our own bodies. And in that way, then, we can communicate within ourselves. By making the connection, the yoga or the union between our minds and our bodies, we can actually function better as individuals. And by functioning better as individuals, then, we're one step closer towards realizing that ultimate goal, the realization that we're all connected. And that way, then, if you practice on a regular basis and make it your duty to do some practice every day, some sort of yoga, and there's many different types of yoga. By making it your duty and trying to connect with yourself, with your own yoga practice, it makes it a little bit easier to recognize within yourself your connection, then to the people around you, to your family, to your friends, to your loved ones, to connect with the people you work with, to connect with the people that you love and the ones that you don't love, to recognize also that we're connected to the earth to recognize that in the 21st centuries it's very important that people realize the need to look beyond the own, you know, the levels of energy and consciousness moving within themselves, but also what's happening with the energy in the world itself. And I think by making that step towards seeing the flow of energy inside yourself, feeling and enhancing the flow of energy and consciousness within yourself, you help recognize what's needed in the world level and number one, most important perhaps, is that idea that energy and consciousness link with communication. And perhaps the best thing you can get from a teacher is the ability to communicate, along with communication also is a sense of love. Love, communication, and energy is all about yoga. And what I wanted to talk about today specifically was this basic misconception that is in the yoga world today. That is, people think that yoga is about breathing. Yoga is learning to how to breathe. But in fact, it's the exact opposite. Learning how not to breathe is closer to the real yoga than learning how to breathe. And what I hope to demonstrate to you and uh, explain on a couple of different levels is that actually the less you breathe, the closer you come to the yogic state, subject to a couple of things. One is that you do have to exhale occasionally all the way to clear your lungs. And that also you need to uh, you know, understand more about the muscles of breathing. Understand also about the physiology and anatomy of breathing, if not on a practical, theoretical level, at least on a feeling, intuitive level. When you look at the yoga texts, the texts on Hatha Yoga say, Hatha yoga is the physical yoga, no? It says that yoga is when you still the fluctuations of the breath. Prana is to do with the life energy that's contained within the breath. Ayama means to extend or lengthen. So the essence of yogic breathing is learning how to breathe a lot slower, a lot quieter, and a lot less than most people think. When you look at the Raja Yoga texts, it says that the essence of yoga is learning how to still the fluctuations of the mind. So when you study someone who's actually doing Raja Yoga or meditation, what you find is that they're almost not breathing at all. And in fact, when you look at people who are really concentrating and think about concentration as being one step towards meditation, there's almost no breath at all. If you look at how much you're breathing right now, until I mentioned the word breath, you probably didn't even realize you're breathing. You're hardly breathing at all, isn't that true? When you study the Hatha Yogi, and they've done several studies on the Hatha Yogi, the person who is able to hold their breath for extended, person, extended periods of time, what they've noticed is with the uh, analyses using brainwave patterns and respiratory patterns being assessed, that the person who can hold their breath for a long time and regularly practice pranayama breath control and extended breath retentions finds that they get the same synchronous, coherent brainwave patterns that are seen in the person who's meditating. I'd like you to try a simple exercise, if you could, with me. And it's a postural exercise, 
I'll take it from a simple version to a difficult version, so you only go to the level which is appropriate for you. If you wish to try it, I'd ask you to stand up. So if you could, stand up just where you are now. And the exercise simply involves standing with your fingertips touching, and I'm going to ask you to do a bit of a balance. Bend your elbows, bend the knees slightly, and to help you balance, three things are important. One is the standing leg should be a little bit bent. Two is the eye should be kept on the floor in front of you. Three, grip your toes onto the floor so your toes become like little claws. Then, either stay in the version of the exercise I've given you first or progressively make it harder with me. From this position then, gripping with the toes, lean towards your right leg. Come to the left toe tip, still with the knee bent, the eyes on the floor and the toes gripping. Stay there or go to the next stage which involves lifting the left leg fully off the floor. Stay there or go to the next stage very carefully by gripping with the toes, keeping the knee bent and looking at the floor, raise up the heel of the standing leg. Then come back down. Now, the exercise. How did you breathe? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> because when you're really concentrating, breath just doesn't happen. But before, before you sit down, try a second exercise. I want you to see the effects of breathing. I want you to start again now, with your fingertips touching, bend the knees, look at one point on the floor, grip with your toes, and now lean onto your left leg. Come to the right toe tip, stay there, or Lift up the right knee away from the floor, so now you're standing on the left leg, knee bent, eyes on the floor, toes gripping, stay there, or raise the heel up off the ground. Now make deep and full breaths in and out. And then come back down. What happened when you breathed? <laughs> Sit down, please. So hopefully that demonstrated on some level at least that Without breathing, there is a stillness in the fluctuations of the mind. But with breathing, if it's more than the gentlest little breath, you actually become very shaky in the head. And this happens on a very physiological level as well. Physically it happens because as you breathe in, the body moves forward. And as you breathe out, the body changes its posture. But on a physiological level, and there's lots of science to show this, the less you breathe, the more you build up carbon dioxide inside yourself. Now, carbon dioxide has specific physiological effects. It's not a bad thing. It's a good chemical inside you. It's a clean type of gas. It's a clean acidic gas. As you breathe less, then you build up carbon dioxide, and that carbon dioxide in your blood becomes carbonic acid. Carbonic acid and carbon dioxide, which build up when you breathe less than normal, will cause more blood to flow through your brain, more blood to flow to your heart, more air to come to your lung cells, and it actually allows hemoglobin to take the oxygen to the furthest reaches of your body and actually leave the oxygen where it should do. In the absence of carbon dioxide, the blood vessels to the brain will shut down, the vessels to the heart also shrink, and the vessels for the lungs actually shrink down as well. And hemoglobin will not release its oxygen to the big toe, for example, even if you might get the blood to your big toe, unless the hemoglobin, which carries your oxygen molecule, sees some carbon dioxide there, it won't release the, the oxygen molecule. These are important and well understood physiological facts. And so the effect then is if you breathe more than normal, how much you're breathing now? Not much. So any more breath than you're breathing now, for the exercise you're doing right now, will be breathing more than normal. And the effects of doing this, which is called hyperventilation, will be then to leave less blood to the brain so you feel dizzy. The mind is scatty and less clear. Also, you can get asthma. Also, you'll find that there's less oxygen coming to your cells, so therefore you have to then use an anaerobic pathway. So you use more energy, you require more food. And also, another very important effect is that when you breathe more than normal, you get rid of the carbon dioxide. When you breathe less than normal, you build it up. 
So breathing more than normal causes a loss of carbonic acid. And less acid means more alkaline. When you breathe less than normal, you build up carbonic acid. Now acid has a very important effect on the nervous system. The nervous system will become calmer in the presence of acid. The nervous system becomes hyped up in the presence of alkaline. Therefore, when you breathe lots of deep breaths, this is breathing more than normal. It builds up alkalinity. That alkalinity makes you dizzy. It makes you nauseous. It makes you queasy. People can get violently ill from hyperventilation. There are many people who give up yoga after the very first class because they're told to do deep, full breaths, and they get dizzy or nauseous. Has anyone ever experienced this? Put your hand up. It happens more than people ever realize. And the reason why people don't realize is because the people who come to yoga and experience this never come back. Because <laughs> it can make people faint. In my youth, when I first started teaching yoga, I thought, let's make it easy for people. All this inhale, arms up, exhale, hands down, inhale, raise the head up. I thought, let's make it easier. Let's just do it. Breathe in, lift up your arms. Breathe out, bring down your arms. Breathe in. One girl on the front row, from straight to the floor. Fainted, just like that. It's so easy to become dizzy or nauseous when you're healthy, especially if you've never done that sort of exercise before. But for someone who's physiologically compromised, like a pregnant person, for example, or someone who's a bit sick, it's almost instantly a way of becoming ill. Of course, most people compensate for this. Most people will compensate for the rapid breathing they do in the exercise they call yoga or other exercises which include deep breathing, such as swimming for example. Controlled exercise of swimming is one of <coughs> it's excessive breathing that we're told to do to do the exercise. What happens is after doing deep breathing where you breathe more than you need to actually you're left with this place where you've depleted your carbon dioxide and having less carbon dioxide inside you makes you less acidic because carbon dioxide in blood is carbonic acid. So with less carbonic acid you become more alkaline. So then your body has to compensate for this unnatural level of alkalinity which makes you queasy, nauseous, weak, tired, makes you feel hungry because most food gives you acid. Most food, especially stodgy food, high-protein food, bread, rice, stodgy things, packet foods, etc., contain lots of acidic residues. So when you do an exercise workout in that case, and at the end of it you feel hungry, it's not because you've used your energy up and you need to refill the energy. Energy doesn't work that way. You feel hungry after exercise, if you feel hungry, it's because you've hyperventilated. That's why swimming often makes people very hungry. Who finds they're hungry after swimming? Look at the room. It's most people in the room who put their hand up, like it's half the room basically. It's very common. It happens in gyms, it happens in uh, many types of exercise when you're jogging. And it's not because you're hungry. It's because you've hyperventilated and you've made yourself alkaline. And although people like medical practitioners will say to you, get more alkaline, the body will compensate. It will give you a type of pH, acid or alkaline, from your food and your diet, your metabolism, but there will also be a compensation with your breathing. And so it works two ways. If you eat very acidic foods, you will be forced to breathe in a way where you deplete and get rid of your carbon dioxide and you will not be able to tolerate carbon dioxide inside yourself because carbon dioxide makes acid but if you're eating lots of acidic food that means you're too acidic so if you eat lots of alkaline foods then you will not be craving to breathe in a way which is hyperventilating you will rather, you will more naturally adopt a mode of breath which is breathing less than normal, which causes you to build up acidic residues, which are clean acid residues of carbon dioxide, which is the essence of yoga. The great yoga masters, Krishnamacharya and his teachers and the other teachers you read about in the late 1800s, 
these masters would live on a diet which was called a falari diet, which is essentially fruit and vegetables. And that's all. This is a very alkalizing diet. But the thing is, if anyone here were to try living off fruit and vegetables, they become, after a very short time, suffering the effects of alkalinity, unless they adopt a pranayama or breathing practice where they start to breathe less. And so the two go hand in hand. The, less, the more alkaline food you eat, the more you can do proper pranayama. The more acidic food you eat, the less you'll be able to hold your breath. The more you hold your breath and get used to not breathing at all, the more you'll be drawn to eating less. The more you'll be drawn to a much healthier diet of fruit and vegetables. And the more you hyperventilate, the more you breathe more than normal, the more you'll be finding that after your practice you're hungry and you're craving rich, stodgy, high-protein, processed food. Am I making sense? You're understanding what I'm saying? It's not commonly talked about. But look, that's just the physiological level. There are lots of reasons why learning how to breathe less than normal can have profound effects on the body. On another level, people think that yoga is about breathing, but in fact it's not about breathing as such, it's about the muscles that you use for breathing. So, for example, I can breathe into my chest, something like this, and my chest gets bigger. I can breathe into my abdomen, like this, and my abdomen gets firmer and flatter. Or, I can do the same thing as breathing into the chest, but without letting the air come in. I use the same muscles I use to expand my chest, but without breathing, I close the air, the holes in, it, in my face. <laughs> With the air. <clears throat> without the air. I can exhale, either to firm my abdomen and blow the air out, <clears throat> or I can just pretend to breathe in, expand my chest, and then tighten the abdomen as if I'm exhaling, but not. <laughs> Could you see the muscles that came up on either side? This is Mula Bandha. The yoga is about Bandha. Bandha means the simultaneous tensings of the muscles around a particular region or joint complex in the body. It's said in the text, the Hatha Yoga text, that you should always practice with Bandha. Mula Bandha is the firmness that comes around the lower abdominal region, or the, the, uh, the lower back complex. Uddiyana Bandha is that co-activation or simultaneous tensings of the muscles around the upper back and the chest. Bandhas work in two ways, either expansive or contractive. You can expand the chest and that makes a vacuum. A vacuum causes a suction. When you pull the chest and, abdo uh, and upper back apart from each other, it causes a suction which normally pulls in air to the nose, but it also pulls up the blood and the body, the base, upwards. This is Uddiyana Bandha. When you tighten the abdomen, it compresses and pushes everything up. Together, it's what helps you push energy from the base of your spine up the spine. But Bandhas work in two ways. You can also contra compre uh, compress the chest. So the same way that you expand the chest to breathe in, you can also compress the chest when you breathe out. <coughs> So if I learn to compress my lower abdomen and expand my chest, this is what happens. With or without the breath, it looks something like this. If I contract the chest while keeping the lower abdomen firm and relaxing the upper abdomen, this is what happens. I've been told it's one of my least attractive looks. But this is soft. There's a big controversy in much yoga which is not well resolved. And that is, which do you breathe into? Do you breathe into your abdomen or do you breathe into your chest? 
In fact, where you breathe depends on where you choose. Each has a specific and different effect. If you breathe into your abdomen, like this, the abdomen gets soft, and the diaphragm is free to move downwards. If you breathe into your chest, like this, the chest expands, but it usually is associated with a restriction of the movement of the diaphragm. Half the yoga schools will teach breathe into your chest. The other half teach breathe into your abdomen. So which is correct? Depending on what you're doing, both have application, but there is a way to resolve the two. The advantage of breathing into your abdomen is that the diaphragm, when it works and moves downwards, causes a calming of your nervous system. You're much more able to be calm when you breathe from the abdomen and you let the diaphragm move outwards, which makes your abdomen puff out. When you breathe from the chest, though, you're more able to keep your abdomen firm. And so depending on what type of yoga practice you're doing, you're better off breathing into your chest or breathing into your abdomen. If all the practice you're doing is, is something like sitting practice, where there's no threat to your spine, or just shove us and resting on the back, then there's no threat to your spine, then by breathing into your abdomen, you're going to stay a lot calmer. It's going to help you to be a much more relaxed practitioner and in life. If you always keep your abdomen firm, which you never see little babies do, it's a very unnatural way of being, and the diaphragm never being used is not good. You become very hypertense. But if you're doing dangerous exercises, such as bending forward, bending backward, twisting, or side bending, without tightening your abdomen, you're inviting the risk, the very high risk, of damaging your lower back. And so anyone who does any sort of understanding of uh, physiotherapy or other exercises where they use the word core stabilization, knows that you can't risk moving your back or doing any sort of radical movement or radical lifting exercise until you brace your abdomen, which is more abundant. You will not be very strong or not retain the safety of your lower back unless you keep your abdomen firm. So in that case then, to breathe in the abdomen for most people will be inappropriate. Can we try a simple exercise? Most of you are on chairs, so I'll ask you to do the exercise like this, where you put your hands on either side of the chair, maybe underneath your buttocks. And I'm going to hopefully give you an idea about how to work with your breath. And the ones who are standing, if you like, can sit cross-legged on the floor, if you want to, and you put your hands on the floor, and what I'm going to ask you to do, and you can try this, is to press on the hands on the floor, grip with your fingers, that helps protect your wrists, and then as you grip with your fingers, lift the hips off the floor or the chair. And we'll try it in three different ways, each with a different type of breath, and you'll perhaps see the difference of learning how to breathe in certain ways. The first exercise I'll ask you to do is to, when I ask you, to lift up as you're breathing in. So just exhale first. Having exhaled, push up your hands. Now breathe in as you lift up. And then come back down. Now that's not wrong or right to do it that way. Many people teach that, but actually it's the hardest way of lifting up. Now I'd like you to try the second way. I want you to lift up while you're breathing out. So prepare again. Take a little breath in. Now exhale as you're lifting up. And come back down. Easier or harder? Easier for most people. Okay, we try one more. Prepare your fingers again. Take a little breath in. Exhale all the way first. Blow out all your air and hold the breath out. Now lift up. And come back down. Easier or harder? Much easier for most people. The less air inside you, the more able you are to firm your abdomen, and the safer your spine is going to be when you bend backwards or forwards. There are many more exercises like this. What I'd like you to feel for a moment is another possibility. Put your hand on your abdomen. Put your hand on your chest. Please, any exercise I offer you to do must be done with your own well-being in mind. So if you're in a special condition, please modify, temper, or leave the exercise alone so don't be in any way you know, dangerous for yourself. If you can, relax your abdomen and then gently breathe in to your abdomen. Let the abdomen puff out. Now gently let the air come out by itself 
relaxed abdomen. Again, relax your abdomen and breathe in as much as you comfortably can without force. Stop breathing for a moment. Now let the air come out in a relaxed way. Stop breathing for a moment. Now tighten your abdomen and see if you can breathe out some more. And hopefully to demonstrate it to yourself, you cannot exhale fully until you grip with your abdomen and exhale fully by tightening the abdomen. Fair enough, no? Now, that means then, if you're going to clear your lungs and empty them of any stale air, you must use Mula Bandha. Similarly, the best strength you'll get in your abdomen will be when you grip those muscles as if you're making a full breath out. What I'd like you to try now is to breathe into your chest. Breathe out first, and now try and expand the chest as you breathe in. And now breathe out. Now try it with your abdomen firm. Tighten your abdomen. Now breathe into the chest again with your abdomen firm. And notice that's much easier for most people. Is that true? Now breathe out again. Now relax your abdomen completely. With the abdomen relaxed, now try and breathe into your chest. And it's much harder to breathe into the chest, isn't it? So, now we try one more exercise. What I'd like you to do first is to breathe into your abdomen and let the chest stay down. So hold one hand on the chest, one hand on the abdomen. Exhale fully again. Hold the breath out for a moment. Keep your chest down. Feel the breath enter the abdomen. Breathe in and let your abdomen push outwards. Good. Now stop breathing. Now try and inhale to the chest and see if you can breathe in some more. And then exhale. Relax for a moment. So hopefully that demonstrated that you cannot inhale fully until you expand the chest. So the ability to expand the chest and firm the abdomen relate to full inhale and full exhale. These are the main bandhas, Uddiyana and Mula Bandha. But they relate very much to your back. If you'd like to try another exercise, if your back is okay to do so, I'd like you to stand up. And just be very cautious as you do this. I'd like you to stand, and in this position, feel the effects of bending the body in a relaxed way. Please don't hurt yourself. I'd like you to take the arms up in the air in a relaxed way, as high as you can. What happens to your back? It arches. Can you feel how the back arches? So bring your hands back down. Before taking your hands up, I'm going to ask you to blow out all the air firmly and hold the breath out. What you'll feel is your abdomen firming. Take a little breath in, tighten the abdomen, exhale all the way and hold the breath out. Keep your abdomen firm and take up the arms. And then bring down the arms. Could you feel the back bends less when you firm the abdomen firm? So, in other words, if you're doing a dangerous back bending exercise, exhaling first makes it a lot safer to come more safely into the pose. I'd like you to try the opposite. Exhale first, and when I say breathe in, I want you to take up the arms. Exhale first, breathe in and take up your arms. And then bring down the arms. Can you feel your back bend a lot more just doing that? And that potentially, if you came into a back arch as you did that, and many people breathe in as they lift to an arch, are more potentially going to damage their back. Now what I'd like you to feel is your chest. Put your hands on the rib cage. And be careful again with the breath, don't force. I'd like you to make a slow in-breath to the chest and feel how the rib muscles expand. And then I'd like you to make a relaxed breath out and notice how the ribs collapse gently relaxing and they go down again. Can you feel that? When you inhale, the chest expands. When you exhale, the chest goes down. But there's another way the chest can work and it's another type of bandha. Breathe in again to the chest. Notice the chest expansion. This is a type of Uddiyana Bandha. But another type of Uddiyana Bandha, which also simultaneously tenses the muscles around the upper back, would involve breathing out fast. Again, just exhale first. Take a half breath in. Now, being careful not to hurt yourself, feel the ribs and make a fast breath out. <clears throat> now, could you feel the rib muscles tighten when you did that? That is a type of Uddiyana Bandha, which is one that will also protect your back. So what I'd like you to do is to make that grip again, hold the breath out for a few moments, and if you need to, take little sips of air, which will keep that grip. And then I'm going to ask you to take up your arms again. So take a little breath in, look down slightly, then force fast breath out, <clears throat> tighten the abdomen, tighten the ribs, hold that firmness, and stretch up your arms again. And then bring the arms back down. 
Could you see how that was the most stable place for your spine to be? Yes or no? Put your hand to the left chair. Most people find this is the reason why in many of the yoga texts then, most of you could feel that, well, most of the yoga texts will have this confusing thing about Uddiyana Bandha. Some people say Uddiyana Bandha is this. And then other texts will say Uddiyana Bandha is a firming of the upper abdomen. I know those of you who practice Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga are told this. And this appears like a complete contradiction. But it's not a contradiction if you appreciate that bandhas are essentially of two extreme forms. One will compress that part of the body, one will expand that part of the body. Another exercise to demonstrate this. The bandha, which uh, bandhas happen all through the body. They happen not just in the uh, three main bandhas. Like if you read Mr. Iyengar's book, Light on Yoga, he says there are three main bandhas. Mula bandha, Uddiyana bandha and Janandara bandha. Three main bandhas means there's more. He just hasn't mentioned it. So other bandhas include the bandhas around the wrists. And I said to you, on an anatomical level, a bandha is the simultaneous tensing of the muscles around a joint complex. Well, when I had you on the floor lifting up, I said grip with your fingers. That will help protect your wrists. If you don't grip with your fingers, your wrists will get jammed when you actually try and lift up. When I said to you lift up on one leg, I said grip with the toes, because that like with the fingers, makes a bund around the wrist or the ankle, which helps you lift safely and more stably. So I'd like you to feel the wrist bundle. Take right hand up, and I want you to feel your wrist soft on either side. Now I want you to make a fist. Notice how there's a firmness front and back of the wrist. Can you feel that? That's a bundle. It's a wrist bundle. Now feel that firmness, and now straighten the fingers. Can you feel how the firmness is again there when you stretch the fingers? It's actually just as firm when the fingers are stretched or when the fingers make a fist. Try a couple of movements. Almost exactly the same muscles being used in two different ways. So then, what I'd like you to feel is how this affects the flow of energy and consciousness within your body. What I'd like you to try is two exercises. The first exercise some of you will feel less. The second exercise most people can feel. Carefully, without poking anyone's ear, I'd like you to stretch the arms out. And with your arms stretched outwards, I'd like you to gently make a fist. Now that fist is actually a compressive bundle which pushes the blood away from the hand to the center of your body. Because more blood comes to your body, it makes your body warmer. Now I want you to stretch your fingers, which is an expansive bundle which pulls the blood away from your body and pulls it to the hand. This makes your body cooler. See if you can feel the difference. Make a closed fist, that pushes blood inwards, makes you warmer. Stretch the fingers, pulls the blood away, makes you one degree cooler. Make a closed fist again, instantly hotly, the same muscles are being used. Relax your hands, put your hand up if you can feel the difference. And have a look around, there's quite a bunch of sensitive people. Not everyone can feel that. One more exercise demonstrates it even more. We see the effect of doing something like Trikonasana. Trikonasana done in many different ways. You can have your left hand stretching out, but your right hand either grabs the right ankle, grabs the floor, or grabs the big toe, any number of possibilities. Well, that right hand is making a closed fist of sorts. The left hand makes stretch fingers. See how quickly yoga can work. And yoga is nothing to do with stretching or flexibility. It's about moving energy and consciousness within yourself. Take your left hand up, take your right hand down. Stretch the left fingers and make a right closed fist. This, you can imagine, is like doing trigonasana. Now I want you to feel the difference if you make a left fist and a right finger stretch. Same muscles being used, but this pushes the energy down. Make a right fist, left finger stretch. Now the right fist pushes the energy up, left fingers pulls the energy up. This is how you normally feel. Close the left fist, stretch the right fingers down, instantly you feel heavier. Can you feel the difference? Right fist, left fingers, instantly you feel right. Change hands. Right hand up, left hand down, make a left fist, a right fingers. This left hand pushes the energy up, the right hand pulls the energy up. Now swap the hands, right fist, left fingers, instantly you feel different. Right hand pushes down, left hand pulls down, you feel heavier. Left fist again, right fingers pulls the energy back up. Lower the hand down. Can you feel how quickly yoga works? We do yoga because it works now, here and now, on a physical, tangible level. Learning how to breathe less makes all the difference. Sit down briefly again. I'll show you one other exercise. This is the compressive, uh, the expansive bundle of the abdomen. The expansive bundle of the abdomen looks something like this. (laughs) 
by contracting the muscles here, I'm pulling energy towards my abdomen and my chest. If I so desire, I could relax the anal sphincter and create such a pressure of suction here and here that I can voluntarily pour air or water into the rectum. This can save you lots of money in colonic irrigations. <laughs> and when you do it properly, you can do it like this. <laughs> People think that yoga is about long, deep breathing. Long breathing, Mr. Jayenga Patavi Joyce have demonstrated, is like breathing in for two minutes. Breathe out for two minutes. That's long breathing. Most people in classes do... <clears throat> they think that's long, deep breathing. That's called hyperventilation. If you learn how to not breathe much, you can begin to do these exercises, which, and I'll demonstrate again, allow you to manipulate your spine, allow you to move the energy inside yourself, and allow you also to reduce your need for food and sleep. I'd like to quickly demonstrate that. How much do I have? Ten minutes? Okay, thank you. If I can quickly demonstrate part of the yoga that we do. Yoga synergy is... Um, a system where basically everyone has to work according to their own pace. What I'll do as a demonstration with the first couple of minutes are closer to what I give in an intermediate level class. And then after that, I'll demonstrate stuff that we can't teach in class, but essentially follows the same principles. Very quickly, to explain the idea of how it works with relation to bandha and breath. People misunderstand stretching and yoga. Yoga is not about stretching or flexibility. If I bend forward over my right leg, it looks like I'm stretching my right leg, but I'm not stretching it. I'm resting my head on my knee. People don't appreciate that the flexible person does not feel a stretch like that. But in the morning, it's different. I'm very stiff in the morning. This is my morning body, my afternoon body. In the morning, I go like this. Oh. <laughs> and I don't want to have pain or suffering. So I choose to only go this far. If I want to go further, I can, but I have to balance. With the same balance I said about bundler, I feel a stiffness at the back of my leg. So, to make it safe, I have to tighten the front of my leg. To, I feel a stiffness at the back of my body, I have to feel a tightness at the front of my body to match. If I tighten the front here and front here to match the stiffness, then I can go forward. But it's not just falling. It's how much does your leg want to be there in the first place. Flexibility should be managed with strength. If I can have some music, I can have a short demonstration. Thank you, Maestro. Mate Sango Tswa Karmani Yoga Sta Guru Karmani Sangam Chakta Dhanam Jai Siddhya Siddhyo Samabhutva Samatvam Yoga Uchirate Aum